earthquakes, eclipses, they're all happening. Duffy's going to explain all that today uh, and why that's happening. So welcome to End Times Prophecy. No. Um, but we want to know as we live and breathe and interact with people, um, uh, what are you doing, God? And then reflect on what he's already done, the victories he's won, and how we integrate that into our lives. And so it, in between hiding our heads in the sand or demanding that everybody line up just like us, there's got to be a way forward. And that's why we gather, to learn how to move forward in between those. So um, I'm going to introduce, I have the privilege of introducing Duffy, who was my professor uh, a, bit, a little bit ago in the time-space continuum. Um, and so Duffy, why don't you come up? He is the professor of Christian Ministries at Grove City College. And we are very pleased to have him here, and I'm going to pray for him, and we're going to get started. Thank you for coming, Duffy. It's a pleasure. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this brother and the years that he has served you, and I pray that this morning you would anoint him by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would open hearts and ears to hear. I pray that fruit uh, would be born as a result of this morning, that seeds of growth would be planted, and I pray that truth would be uh, clearly heard. I pray that you would equip each and every one here uh, much better than they were when they came in. I thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. We want to thank you, David. Thanks so much for coming out this morning. I really appreciate it. Especially with the uh, beautiful sunshine after all the days of lousy weather. I uh, was just thinking, man, you could be, you know, you're probably thinking I could be working in the yard. I could be enjoying the sunshine. I could be... Uh, just, uh, I don't know, taking it easy. And I imagined to myself as you were driving over that some of you were thinking to yourselves, this better be good. <laughs> so I want us to talk this morning about dealing with disappointment. No, no actually, I'm going to start this morning. Uh, one, of my, one of my hobbies is optical illusions. So if we could switch the screen over so folks can see my slides. I am, uh, I'm sort of a big fan of, how many fans of optical illusions are in the house this morning? Okay, about seven people. Well, uh, yeah, optical illusions uh, are, are, are simply, you, you know, basically you've seen these, you kind of know how they work, where you, you look at an image and, and, uh, and immediately some people see one thing and some people see something else, right? So how many of you, how many of you see uh, uh, a girl with bangs in her eyes, right? And how many of you see the goldfish in the bowl? Excellent. Okay. All right. I always start off with easy stuff so people feel good. How about, uh, how about this one, the, the uh, boat in the snowstorm? How many see that? Uh, how about the, the Christmas tree out in the field in the... Okay. Just a couple of people there. See? Courage already. How about this? Uh, is this a rabbit or is this a duck? Okay. All right. Uh, this is an interesting one because this one uses uh, what's called... Uh, this is called negative space. So, so how many of you actually see the flower here? Okay, I, I would kind of hope for almost every hand on that. Yeah. Uh, how many of you see uh, the face of a young girl? All right, all right. How many of you see the boat in the snowstorm? <laughs> all right. How about this? This one's kind of fun because this one's called a kinetic, a kinetic optical illusion. Uh, with a kinetic optical illusion, the, the idea is that if you look at this, uh, right, it's kind of hard to project when you put it on a big screen, but if you look at this, it should, yeah, it sort of looks like it's rotating. It sort of looks like, and, 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 and if you uh, actually drink six cans of Red Bull, uh, it becomes a Harley and starts to circle uh, the room. It's, 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 it's really, amazing. this is kind of a cool one. Actually, I just came across this one accidentally, but uh, it sort of poses the question, who is hugging whom? Who is hugging whom? Hmm, yeah, I like that one. And then, uh, and then this is an interesting one. I'm just going to warn you, this next one is a little bit, uh, is a little bit uh, troubling to look at. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you see a young woman in front of a dresser bureau mirror? How many see that? Okay. How many of you see a skull, a human skull? Okay. And see, a lot of that has to do with your experiences with romance. Uh, okay, this is an interesting. This is kind of fun. This one, if you look at it, uh, you, you, I found this one on a church bulletin board. You have to tilt your head that direction. Tilt your head that direction. It's called the stones cry out. The stones cry out. 
I'm going to give you 10 seconds to explain that to the person next to you if they do not see it. Real quick, 10 seconds, go. Make sure they see it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. I see a guy in the back who says, I still see a duck. Okay. Uh, yeah, stay away from the caffeine. Okay, how about this one? Uh, this one, this one also, uh, you have to, you're going to have to uh, tilt your, this is called the stones cry out. Uh, <laughs> just, just, just tilt. All right, this one's kind of a fun one. This one, uh, this one actually is, is kind of cool because when you look at it this way, uh, it looks like the face of a young uh, grenadier uh, soldier, right? But, but actually, if you flip it, if you flip it 180 degrees, all of a sudden you see this salty old sailor uh, dude, right? That's kind of a cool one. I like that. You want to see that one again? Yeah, because that one's kind of cool. So you start off, uh, you see this guy, uh, I don't know, maybe he's in his 20s, something like that. And then just by flipping him 180 degrees, we put about, uh, I don't know, 30 more years on the dude. It's kind of a... Kind of cool. Speaking of uh, young, young, uh, cool dudes, you might not even see this. You <laughs> might not even pick up on this one. But this one, if you look really, really closely, it's <laughs> weird. Uh, it, it's just like, holy cow. Uh, yeah, yeah. You want to see that again? It's good. We're going to watch it several times. Uh, it's funny because the more uh, my wife and I look at this, we, the more we agree. I do kind of look like Brad Pitt, but, uh, but I, I, I like optical illusions because optical illusions are minding of something that's very, very important when you think about wisdom, and that is how easily we are duped. We think we see the whole picture, but there's more to the picture than we see. We, we, we're pretty sure by nature, we just sort of have this sort of this inbred arrogance, the Bible calls it sin, that suggests I really see things as they are. But optical illusions remind us how easy, how easy it is to miss the big picture. And so I want us in this first session this morning to think together about, well, well why do people make bad decisions? Why, why is it that we lack wisdom? What are some of the factors that lead us to make uh, bad choices in this, in this crooked world? And so this is what we're going to do. I'm just going to start off by posing the question to you. Uh, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. I want you to turn to the person on your right or your left, doesn't matter. And I would like you to think with them about this question on the screen. Why do people make bad decisions? Uh, give about 30 seconds. You want to jot down three or four or five reasons. That's great. And then we'll do a quick inventory, okay? 30 seconds. Why do people make bad decisions? Go. Okay, let's do a quick uh, survey. Uh, somebody tell me, why do people make bad decisions? Just uh, raise your hand and yell it out so we can hear you. Why do people make bad decisions? What is it that leads us to, to not see the whole picture? Yes, sir. They have bad information to start with. They have bad information to start with. Good. Bad information to start with. Somebody else. Yes, ma'am. Okay, making decisions on the basis of emotion. Just, just on the heart. Yeah. Somebody else, what's another? Yes, ma'am. Motives. motives, motives, yes. Uh, what's another? Yes, sir. Say it again. They think it's a good decision. Yeah, you don't have to get mad. Uh, yeah, they, they, they think it's a good decision. Okay, yeah. Self satisfaction, self satisfaction. Way over there, yell it out. They don't have a biblical worldview. Thank you, this young man <laughs> from the actual Colson uh, Initiative. Uh, yeah, uh, somebody else. Anybody else? Okay, right here. Lack of experience. Lack of experience. Yeah, I mean, it, there, there's so many different factors, aren't there? I mean, when you start to think about it, all the different issues that we've, that we've raised this morning, you just go, holy cow. I mean, lack of information, you know, lack of experience, choosing on the basis of emotion, uh, you can go on on peer pressure. I mean, it's discouraging, isn't it? You know, and, and so, you know what, let's, uh, let's just close in prayer.
<laughs> no, but it, it is a story. What I want to do this morning is think in this first session about why do people make bad choices. We're really not prepared to make wise decisions uh, until we squarely face some of the factors that lead us to make bad decisions. I'm going to mention three. I'm going to suggest three. And they're really pretty simple, but they're pretty, pretty important. The first one is this. One of the reasons that people, I think, in our culture, they make bad choices. And when I say people, I'm talking about us. All of us in our culture, none of us is exempt from this, is that, first of all, we, we have a bad compass. We have a bad compass. We live in a culture that says <clears throat> there's no such thing as right or wrong. There's no such thing as truth or falsehood, light or darkness, righteousness or sin. It's all kind of gotten blurred together in this huge vat of like whatever, right? It's, it's, uh, I saw a woman not too long ago in a quiz show. And she was a perfect child of the culture. She was asked this question. Listen to this. She was asked, which do we need the most, the sun or the moon? Which do we need the most, the sun or the moon? And she was great. She goes, okay. Okay. We need the moon the most. Because it, like, shines at night, like when it's dark. And during the day when the sun is shining, it's like light anyway. And, 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 and you know what's scary is at first, it, it made sense to me. But, but I thought to myself, now here's a woman who doesn't know where the light is coming from. And when you don't know where the light is coming from, guess what? You're going to spend a fair amount of your time walking in darkness, we, we live in a culture who has essentially said that, that any kind of authoritative assertion about truth or about light needs to be muted. That, that, it's, that it's in fact arrogant or narrow to, to even suggest that there is a true north or a true south. Let's watch. Let's watch with the audio on. I'll start it again when the audio is on. Hold it. My fault, Kyle. Start it over. Now, do you hear that last statement? That's interesting, isn't it? Whatever you believe is right or wrong, that should apply. Whatever. Now, now that's an interesting statement because if, if by that standard of right and wrong, then, then pretty much everything is possible. Everything is permissible. It, it, it really reminds us of that passage in Romans chapter 1 where the apostle Paul says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. But this, is, this is clearly a guy that's not uh, inarticulate. I mean, he, he's, he's, uh, he's a guy that uh, it looks like he's been educated. He sounds like he's been educated. And, and, and yet his, his view of morality, his view of, of like what's right and what's wrong pretty much allows no compass whatsoever. Whatever you believe is right or wrong, that should apply. I mean, it reminds me of the drunk, uh, you know, who complained, you know, all day long I've been asking people what time it is, and all day long I've gotten a different answer. You know, somebody's got to be willing to say, here's the truth, set your heart by it, set your brain by it, but we live in a culture that has muted that voice. We have a bad compass. Second reason, and I bet some of you mentioned this in your conversation, is we have a problem with bad company. Bad company. If, if, uh, if uh, I ask a room full of uh, teenagers, you know, why do we make bad decisions? Almost always one of the first answers is peer pressure. 
peer pressure. And, 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 and it's true. I mean, we all know this. We've all experienced this. Uh, the research absolutely is a slam dunk on this matter. That, that one of the greatest predictors of anybody's moral choices are the moral choices made by their closest friends. It's called sociologically a friendship cluster. And that friendship cluster probably has more impact on our moral choices than, than, than any other factor is that we make bad decisions because we're hanging around people who make bad decisions and, and their decisions impact our decisions. My dad, um, I, I, I don't think he was quoting this passage, but, but my dad um, he used to kind of warn us about the company that we keep. He said, you know, Paul puts it like this, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. Bad company ruins good morals. My dad used to paraphrase it. He said, if you sleep with the dogs, you're going to get fleas. And, and, and yes, this dog is on drugs. But, but it's a reminder of, of how the people we hang around will often lead us to make bad choices. So one of the reasons we make bad decisions is because of, 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 of bad company. So we have bad compass, bad, bad company. Let's look at a third factor, and that's bad comprehension. Bad comprehension. Um, I, I guess I would describe this this way. Bad comprehension is that we think we're really, really savvy, but we're easily fooled. We think we are easily savvy, but we are easily fooled. And this is what we saw with the optical illusion, how easy it is to be fooled by what we see. Um, I, I remember one day I was walking into, the, uh, I was walking into my, my school in Pinewood Elementary School in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I grew up, and, and I was probably about probably either first or second grade, I don't remember, but I'm walking down the sidewalk, and um, as I'm walking down the sidewalk, I see these little tiny white BB-sized pellets just drawn out along the sidewalk. And I'm like, you know, six, seven years old, and I go, I wonder, I wonder what that is. And, and, and so I ate a bunch of them, you know? <laughs> I just figured, out, I wonder what that is. I, I believe I'll consume it. And uh, it turns out, actually, uh, it was not a little snacks they left out for us. Um, in fact, to be truthful, to this day, I don't know exactly what it was. Although I will say this, I have never had a mice problem. But, uh, but, but I, I, I can say this, that, that made me really sick. That left a terrible taste in my mouth. But in that little incident that morning in front of Pinewood Elementary School, what you actually saw is a parable of what happens in our culture. People look at stuff, and it looks interesting. It looks cool. It looks intriguing. It looks like freedom. It looks like love. And they consume it only to discover too late that it's toxic. And it's because we, as a culture, are, are easily duped. We are easily fooled. And you think about all the different images that you and I are exposed to on a daily basis. All the different pictures come to us in digitalized forms from our social media, through our phones and magazines, television ads, all the different images that we see, we are bombarded constantly. And when we have a bad compass and we have bad company, we keep bad company, it's easy to see how that bad comprehension can sort of lure us to, to consume things that in fact are toxic. And, and, of course, most of us don't think that we're susceptible to this kind of problem. Most of us feel like, no, no, I get it. That's a problem for some people, but I'm far too savvy. I'm way too savvy to be duped by that. There was some interesting research done several years ago by uh, two psychologists, Elizabeth Loftus and John Palmer, at the University of Washington. Um, and they showed a group of people uh, a film of an automobile accident. And... Um, and then they divided the group up into two groups. So they, everybody had seen the exact same clip of the automobile accident. But then they divided the group up into two parts. They asked one group, how fast were the cars going at the time of impact? They asked the second group, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? And what they discovered was that the group that heard the question using the word smashed was likely to report an impact speed of about 20 miles per hour faster just because that word had been changed. 
Just because they had all seen the exact same video, but that one word, that one little word had an impact. In other words, it recreated a memory of something they did not see. In fact, a week later, they brought everybody back in and did the exact same thing, showed the film again. Of course, they don't really tell the people what they're researching, what they're trying to test here, so that would skew the results. But they showed the film a second time, and this time they said, uh, here's a question, how fast were the cars going at the time of impact? How fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? The group that heard the question using the word smashed was likely to report an impact speed of 20 miles per hour faster than the group that heard the question using the word impact. In other words, just that word recreated their view of reality. In fact, they discovered, Loftus and Palmer, that by, by just changing the word, they could manipulate the reality of the people who saw the clip. They could change it just by changing one word. And, and, and so the question really is this, if one word... If one word makes that much of an impact on my impression of reality, my perception of reality, how much for a whole video full of words or a whole movie full of words or a whole song full of words? We don't, we don't think these things are impacting us. It's not as if the people came in and said, hey, let's all report an impact speed 20 miles. It'll be an awesome experience. They didn't, they didn't do this intentionally. They, they, they were trying to be honest. These were savvy people, but they were duped. They were duped just because Loftus and Palmer recreate this impression on the basis of their perceptions. We think we're really savvy, but we are easily fooled. This, of course, is an old story. This is not a new phenomenon. You, you remember back in the Old Testament when uh, Abraham and Lot uh, had moved off in um, sort of pursuit of the will of God. In Genesis chapter 12, God says, Abraham, go. And, and Abraham went. And the scripture tells us that Lot, his nephew, went with him. His nephew went with him. Then in Genesis 13, their herds have begun to increase, their crops have multiplied, and they can't stay on the same piece of land anymore. And, and, and so uh, Abraham makes to his nephew a very generous offer to say, hey, hey, Lot, you know what, we, we got to separate because our herdsmen are feuding out there and we're kinsmen. So he said, look, you want to move to the right hand? I'll go to the left. You want to go to the left hand? I'll go to the right. You get first dibbies. And, and, and so Lot says, okay. And the scripture tells us in first, excuse me, in Genesis chapter 13, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. And then you see the little parenthetical phrase. Oh, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan. Lot settled among the cities of the valley, moved his tent as far as Sodom, and now the bad company starts to come in. The men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. And if you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know that it is a very unpleasant story. It's a story that really ends up to be the, the tale of a, of a cosmic barbecue but it didn't look that way going in going in it looked like the garden of the lord it, it looked like uh, the land of egypt in the direction of zoar it looked fantastic but it was wrong it was an illusion it was an illusion and this of course is the story of humankind this is this is something that happened all the way back in the beginning of human history you'll remember that 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 the sin entered into human history when somebody saw a tree and it was a delight to the eyes. It was a delight to the eyes. We, we have an eye problem. We do not see well. We do not perceive well. We have bad comprehension. I remember the guy that <clears throat> discipled me when I was a young Christian. He, he said one of the ways to understand sin is that sin is basically the perversion of God's good things. So, so in other words, God causes us to live life abundantly. God wants us to live a life of flourishing. Well, what the enemy does is he perverts life. He flips that, and instead of live, you have live perverted, which is evil. This is the story of humanity. We, we think we're choosing something that's going to really give us life, but we end up walking into something that, that is toxic. The writer of Proverbs puts it like this. There's a way, there is a way that seems right to a man. It looks good but in the end, it leads to 
death. It leads to death. And this is just, this is just the, the, the nature of humanity. It's just the, the way we are. You know, I, I remember as a little kid, you know, I'd, I, I, would, I would trust my, my, my mom, my dad, for, for any accurate information. And, and, and that's where I always went. And I remember being in the car one day, and, and we're just sitting there. I go, Mom, I said, I said, how fast is this? You know, I was doing that thing out the window of the car like that. We get to a stop. I said, Mom, how fast is this? And, 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 and you know, she tries to kind of give me an answer and stuff. Because, and, I mean, I trust her. Like, she's my mom. Like, Mom, here you are. Here's my arm. Velocity. You know, I mean, that's it. But, but the thing is, we, we have this perception that we think we see it right, and we're also often in the wrong. That's why the writer of Proverbs in chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight. Or, or, or we might even paraphrase it this way. Do not rely on your own eyesight because we're easily duped. We are easily duped. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So we have a problem of bad compass, first of all. Bad compass, no sense of right and wrong. Secondly, we have a problem of bad company. We hang around people who make bad decisions. And thirdly, bad comprehension. Bad comprehension. We think we are really savvy, but we are easily duped. Now, our purpose today is not to just sort of uh, writhe in the, in the badness of our unwise decisions. We want to think about how can we make wise decisions? How can we make straight choices in a crooked world? So let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit and think about how we can make wise decisions. I'm going to start by, by giving you a definition of what do I mean when I say wise decision. When I say a wise decision. And I would describe a wise decision this way. A wise decision is going to be characterized by three characteristics. Number one, a wise decision is a decision that pays attention to the process of decision making. It pays attention to the process of decision-making. If you're just going to decide who's going to kick off, then a coin toss is great. That's a perfectly appropriate way. Uh, that's a perfectly appropriate process to determine who's going to get the ball first. But that's probably not a very good way of choosing, for example, a spouse. You know, uh, it, it's great, you know, when you're trying to choose up teams, say, okay, everybody, one potato, two potato, three potato, four. But, but that's not a good idea if you're trying to choose a, a husband or, a, okay, but, you know, uh, that, that's not going to work. In other, words, in other words, the process that one uses to decide needs to match the nature of the decision one's trying to make. And, and so a wise decision is a decision where your process your process is something you give some thought to. Is this a good process to make a good decision? There are some, there are some situations in which your decision might well be fueled by reflex. But there are other situations in which uh, your reflex might lead you to make a really bad decision. And so you have to pay attention to the process of decision making. Secondly, a wise decision is one that has considered possible outcomes. It is considered possible outcomes, that there are good outcomes and there are possibly bad outcomes. And so a wise decision is one that recognizes, okay, with every decision I make, there are going to be different outcomes, different consequences. A wise decision is one where you actually consider those outcomes. And then number three, a decision that's wise is a decision where the decision maker is willing to own the consequence of the decision. A good decision, a wise decision, is one where the decision maker is willing to own the consequence of the decision. Now, if you're looking at this, you might say, well, Duffy, you didn't mention anything about the Bible. You didn't mention anything uh, about, about God here. I'm trying to talk in the broadest possible terms about what is a wise decision. And what I'm suggesting, let's say, if I'm talking to, to a, a teenager or if I'm talking to a, a child, a teenage a son or a daughter, uh, or I'm talking to a person in my youth group, or I'm just talking to a friend, Maybe they're not a believer. I still want to help them make a wise decision, even as a non-believer. Well, the most important decision is to make a decision for Christ. I get that. I agree with that. But I want to help them, given where they are, to make the wisest decision possible. And so I've tried to define this in the broadest terms possible. 
But these three, these three factors are absolutely critical for making any kind of wise decision, whether you're a believer or you're not a believer. These three factors are factors that are essential for making a wise decision. You say, okay, all right, I get that. Those, that's our parameters. Uh, that, that's the boundaries. How do we help people make those wise decisions? And I'm going to suggest this morning a very simple process. When I was a little kid um, in elementary school, uh, one of the coolest moments that I remember, especially in my first grade class, was when Mrs. Moose invited Policeman Bill to come to our class and to talk to us about traffic safety. This is about the very first week of class. And it's very cool because he actually brought in uh, a real traffic light and put it on Mrs. Moose's desk and plugged it in. And, and we're going, well, that's awesome, but we'd like to see your gun. But, but, uh, but it, anyway, he kind of showed us this thing and he went in there and, uh, and, and as he's talking to us about traffic safety and like, what do you do, you know, when you get to a, you get to an intersection. You're not sure which way to go. You're not sure, do I step or do I stop? He, he taught us three very, very basic ideas. He said, when you get to an intersection, you remember this? You have to stop what? Look and listen. Stop, look. And I remember he hammered this into a stop, look, listen. I mean, you remember first grade kids, stop, look, listen. You know, Policeman Bill, we are on drugs. And, and it was just like, just, just, just this uh, mantra. And he had us kind of repeat this over and over. Stop, look. In fact, I got, this is one of the hard parts about for me because, because I uh, had a hard time because I would confuse, I'd get to an intersection and I would confuse uh, Policeman Bill uh, with Fireman Bob. And, and, and so when I'd get to an intersection, um, I, 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 I would stop drop room. And you know what? Some of you are laughing, but I'm going to tell you something. Traffic stopped for me. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'd never seen anybody, uh, you know, cross the street like that. And, and, and sometimes I'd come home all dirty and my clothes are torn up. Mom said, what happens? I crossed the street and it's painful. And, and in fact, to this day, I, I avoid intersections, but, 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 but I, I want us today to remember Policeman Bill's advice because I think those three words are really, really helpful in terms of how do you make wise choices. How do you make wise choices? This is going to maybe seem overly simplistic, but I think this is a really great place to start. Straight choices in a crooked world, the very first step is to stop and think backwards. Stop and think backwards. You say, well, well, that's awesome because most of the people I know, that is exactly what they do is they think backwards. Well, what I mean by this is when I say think backwards, I mean that basically every time we make a decision, you want to stop and think backwards. Explain it like this. Every single one of us who is here right now, we arrived here, we are here right now because an hour or so ago, maybe even two hours ago, you thought to yourself that at 9.41 in the morning, I want to be seated in the Fellowship Hall Hope Community Church. And based on that decision, you thought backwards about every other decision you would have to make to put you in that place at 941. In other words, you made your decision by thinking backwards. Now at 941, having listened to 35, 40 minutes of the session, you might be going, and that was clearly a bad decision. <laughs> but, but, but the point is you're here now. You're here now. And the way you got here was by thinking backwards. This is exactly the process that, that Jesus is referring to when he says in Matthew chapter 7, he says, enter by the narrow gate. Why? Well, admittedly, the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. In other words, you don't choose your gate by looking at how many people are going to go through the gate. You don't choose your gate by deciding which one's wide and which one's narrow. You choose your gate by asking yourself, where do you want to end up? What are the consequences of this choice? And based on this choice, this gate, this narrow gate, few there are who enter it, but it leads to life, I'm going to enter by the narrow gate. That's what it means to stop. That's what it means to stop and think backwards. Now, uh, this, this, is, this is not easy. This is not easy. It's not easy for us. And, and, and of course, it's especially difficult 
uh, when you're younger, maybe you, you, you are more driven by impulse and hormone and just the, the moment. And so, and, and, and yet all of us struggle with this. So what I want to do, I, I thought it might be helpful this morning. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're talking with somebody, or maybe you yourself are trying to make a wise choice. I want to teach you a very simple way to help someone learn to think backwards. It's a little game that me and another guy invented. It's called the option play. And you see at the bottom of the page there, uh, the option play uh, kind of looks like uh, two end-to-end pitchforks. I actually think it looks like two NCAA brackets. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a two end-to-end pitchforks. And the way it works is I'm going to give you a case study. Of course, real life doesn't just give us case studies. It gives us complicated real issues sometimes, heart issues. But just for the sake of learning how to do this, I'm going to give you this morning a little bit of a case study. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you uh, learn how to think backwards by doing this little game called the option play, okay? So we'll start off with the case study. Uh, here's my case study. Uh, John and Mary have been dating for six months. You may think it's just too simple, but just, just for demonstration. John and Mary have been dating for six months, and Mary's parents are starting to get concerned <clears throat> because John is the pastor of their church. That's not true. And no, I just thought I'd make that a little bit more interesting. But actually, uh, no, uh, they're concerned because, because John and Mary are in high school, and John is not a Christian, and Mary is a Christian. And John and Mary, you know, they're, they're starting to get more serious. And Mary's parents recognize that one of the reasons people make bad decisions is because they hang around people that make bad decisions. And they're concerned for their daughter, Mary. And so they say, Mary, look, uh, we had hoped, we had hoped that you would come to this conclusion yourself, but you haven't. And, and so now we're at a point where we're going to say to you, look, you're going to have to break off your relationship with John. Uh, we've talked about this and stuff, but now we really think we're going to have to make it. You're going to have to stop seeing John altogether. If you see him at youth group or church, that's one thing. But aside from that, you're going to have to stop seeing John altogether. Okay? So the question is, in the option play, is what choice does Mary make? What does Mary decide to do? So this is what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to just kind of get maybe one or two other people. If you can do it without, uh, you know, wrenching your neck around too much. I want you on the left-hand side of the pitchfork, I would like you to think of three possible options available to Mary and write them on the left-hand side of the pitchfork, okay? I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do this. Go. Three possible options. Go. Okay, time's up. Let's, uh, let's see what you came up with. Somebody give me uh, one possible option available to Mary. What might, I'm not asking you what Mary should do, but what might Mary do? One option. Somebody uh, raise your hand. Yes, sir. What, what might Mary do? Obey. What? She might obey. She Ed says. She might obey her parents completely. She might just obey her parents completely. Fantastic. Okay, yes, ma'am. Ask John to go to church with her. Okay. Okay, great. Anybody else have way back there, yell it out. Did you say hide the relationship? Let's just take a minute and pray for this sister uh, right now. Um, okay, all right. Hide the relationship. Holy cow, no one's ever said that. Uh, okay, uh, somebody else. Yes, ma'am. What was it? Run away. Run away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me just say, you don't have to answer if you don't need to. Okay, yeah, uh, no, uh, okay. Somebody else, give me, a, give me another possible. Yes, ma'am. I would say you try to obey. Try to obey. Just, you can't do it. Yeah, you just try. You give it your best shot, maybe a night or two, and you go, no, this is not working. And, uh, and, and so you go back and, and date the guy. Yes, ma'am. 
pray for his conversion. Thank you. There's one Christian in the room. Okay, pray for. Yeah, I mean, I basically, uh, I, I, first of all, let me just say, I'm very disappointed in your responses. But uh, yeah, I, I basically came up with, okay, uh, she obeys her parents. Thank you, Ed. Uh, she obeys her parents. She disobeys her parents. She disobeys, just, and, and we're talking about just outright, just, just mom, take a long walk off a short pier. Like, I, I'm going to date who I want to date. You, you, you know, that's, mm-hmm. this is my choice. And then, and then, I hadn't wanted to write this, but Mary dates Ron on the sly. <laughs> By the way, I forgot. Usually when I do this case study, it's Ron and not John. Sorry about that, but okay. Uh, <laughs> you're going, oh, that's another option. <laughs> Cut John out and start dating Ron. <laughs> but uh, yeah. It's funny because sometimes when I do this case study with a group of teenagers, they'll go, well, uh, they could maybe do some kind of compromise, like very postmodern. Uh, you know, they could maybe do some kind of, okay, 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 Ron could date Mary's mom. You know? <laughs> but okay, so, so basically you got three possible choices over here, okay? This is the next step in the option play. Next step is this, is what did Mary do? And here's how it works. At this point, you take one of the options on the left-hand side of the pitchfork and you write it in the middle section of the bracket. And then I want you to ask this second question. You're going to first of all choose what did Mary do. And then that same group of three, I want you to think about this. If Mary chooses to do that, what might result from that decision? Okay? And you're going to write that on the right-hand side of the pitchfork. 30 seconds, go. Go. What might she decide to do? What did she decide? And then what might result? Hey, are you are you caught? Are you gonna stop at ten, or should I remind yeah. you? Okay, you're, you're, you you see it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, just for the sake of time, and, and, and to be honest, frankly, partially because I'm afraid of how you might answer, let me, uh, let me, uh, let me sort of, we'll do it corporately, okay? So, so just, uh, just for the sake of demonstration, we'll just pick one, and then we'll sort of do it uh, corporately. So, so, okay, I put on the screen three possible uh, choices you might make. They're similar, I think, to what you perhaps wrote down. So she disobeys her parents, she obeys her parents, she dates Ron on the sly, okay? Uh, Just for the heck of it, to work our way through, which would you like to say Mary choose? Which would you like to choose? I knew you were going to say that. Okay, Uh, Mary dates Ron on the sly. So if she dates Ron on the sly, what might happen, okay? What might happen? Number one, she might get caught. She might get caught. Number two, she might get away with it, become a prostitute, take drugs, and get a reality TV show. <laughs> Hopefully, it would not be that bad. I don't know, but, uh, but we don't. And then number three, she might, she might get away with it. Ron becomes a Christian, memorizes the New Testament, leads the entire high school to Christ. Okay, now, now here, here's what I do. Is when I have these consequences on the right-hand side of the pitchfork, I want to ask two questions. They're two pretty fundamental questions. The first question is this. How likely... Is this to really happen? I mean, in what universe is this likely to happen? And then secondly, if it does happen, is this really a, a consequence? Is this really an outcome that you, that you desire? Is this really an outcome that's desirable? And if you pose those two questions, and I've done this on a number of occasions to a group of teenagers, they will almost immediately tell you that she probably is going to get caught. She's probably going to get caught. And if she gets caught, that's not going to be pleasant. That's probably not going to be good. Uh, And and, and, I mean, they're just, you know, that's just probably what's going to happen and it's not going to be good. You go, well, what about the next thing? Mary gets away with it, uh, becomes a prostitute, takes drugs, gets a reality TV. You know, inevitably, somebody goes, no way, that's stupid. That's not going to happen. A lot of people date non Christians and they don't get pregnant. and, 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 And of course, they're absolutely right about this. That, that, that sometimes, you know, when you hear people say, don't, don't, you know, is you, you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not as if, you know, the world's going to collapse. 
But then somebody will say, no, I'm not stupid. Somebody will raise their hand and say, I'm not stupid. I know you don't get pregnant from dating a non-Christian. I'm just saying, all I'm saying is if Mary compromises here and lies to her parents, she might compromise here. And if she compromises here, she might compromise here. And then she might compromise here. And it's sort of the slippery slope of, of, of the way our lives often work when we face temptation, when we, when we really want to do something anyway, is that little by little by little we sort of make a compromise and then we find ourselves in a place we did not expect to be in. But every single teenager, anybody would agree, I think, probably that if you do wind up in that place where you get away with it, become a prostitute, take drugs, and get a reality, that's not exactly a desirable outcome. You know, you, 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 you don't see, you know, like a prostitute Barbie. You know, that, that's, not sort of your, that's not sort of the ideal that people are hoping for. That's not the end game that most people want. And what about the last thing there? Mary gets away with it. Ron becomes a Christian, memorized New Testament, leads the entire high school to Christ. Uh, is that going to happen? No, not, not very likely. I mean, it could. It could. God's a big God. God is a big God. But it, just rationally, you don't go, oh, yeah, he's going to be so impressed by her lack of integrity that he goes, I want to be like you. You know, that, that's probably not going to happen. But let me ask you, if it does happen, is that good? Yeah, it's awesome. We have another brother in Christ, another member of God's family. This is fantastic. So, so now, okay, then let's think backwards. If, if the first possible consequence is bad and it likely will happen, that's not good. The second possible consequence, okay, it probably won't happen, but if it does happen, that's not very good. The last possible consequence uh, is really, really good, but it probably won't happen. So if I don't like those outcomes, thinking backwards, I should not make that choice. And if you do it right, you can actually get tic-tac-toe. But here's the thing, is that, is that what, what really we're talking about here is simply thinking backwards. Thinking backwards. It, it's, it's fundamental. Even Paul in Romans chapter 6, he's explaining the logic of obedience. He says, when you were slaves of sin, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time? In other words, he says, think backwards. You know, what was the outcome? What was the harvest of those choices? You were free to choose, but what did you end up with as a harvest? The end of those things is death. So thinking backwards, that's not a wise decision. That's not a smart way to operate. The writer of Proverbs puts it like this, food gained by fraud tastes sweet but you end up with a mouthful of gravel. You have to ask yourself at the end of the day, what do I want? What do I want to end up with? And to make a wise choice, you stop and think backwards. Now, we said uh, the, second, the second issue that we have to confront if we're going to make wise decisions is bad comprehension. We said we think we're really savvy, but we are easily duped. We're easily duped. And so that's why it's not enough, it's not enough if we're going to make wise decisions to stop and think backwards, we also need to look for the lie, to look for the lie. And uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about how to do that. We'll take about a 10-minute break, and hopefully uh, by then I'll, I'll, I'll come up with something. So, uh, okay, quick break. Dave, do you need to make any announcements? Yeah, we're going to take... We're going to take 10 minutes, and then there'll be a video playing in about at, at the 10-minute mark to gather you back in, and then we'll start from there. So uh, the drinks are back there, snacks, help yourself, and I'll see you in 10.